so you have your brand DNA and it's like you sort of open your front door and like what next given like the last year of streetwear sort of like flowing where do you think like the next evolution of these ideas are going to land us and say the next year uh, first of all I think it's all over the place literally speaking <laughs> like streetwear is not uh you know, limited to certain cities like New York or London or Paris or Tokyo, where it's a global phenomenon. Yeah. Then the way streetwear is being sold is all over the place. So you have the local shops, you have online, mm -hmm. you have the retail shops, but you have also direct to consumer. But what's interesting now is that, and this happens with your brand, but also Supreme and Anti Social Social Club. Yeah. yeah. Um, they operate as their own brands, their own retailers, but then they sort of wholesale in a different way because some of these kids who line up to <laughs> pick up stuff, they go and they operate their own little shops, like Big Cartel, Shopify. Yeah. So the secondary market is the new retail. Yeah, the street value yeah. is determined. Let's remember that streetwear, you know, in as many versions of definitions that there are, to me, at the essence, it's like, covetable product it's limited so the reason why like if you got to get to it first is the difference between product in that our world versus like mass consumer product because it's like that t-shirt or those pair of sneakers like if you go next week they would still be there but i think once streetwear started like co-defining like nike woven or mm. something like that I think that's probably the, the start of the whole streetwear thing. Because before that, you wouldn't go to a streetwear shop because it didn't exist. <laughs> yeah, and then when, say, like, I don't know, what, like, technically, one of the first moments that I remember was the Woven going to Riving, like, Rivington yep. Street. To a so it yep. was like big company realizes, like, hey, we need to do some energy marketing. We got some new stuff that we can't just put in a regular pipeline. Let's give it to this offbeat store. The store gets this gem. Then it's like, hey, you got to get it now, or otherwise you're just going to have FOMO because everyone else, you're going to see this product. And so basically that trickle effect has just been happening over and over. Then a little brand like mine or anyone can just say, hey, here's a limited thing. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's not for everyone, which is the fever. And I think like we we just finished on is like department stores. There's a lag time for them to catch up. Independent stores, an indie store can grow into a major store off of like the right amount of this sort of like heavy streetwear product, mixing that with regular things because it also has to mix with like people. Yeah. Like people that desire the coveted thing, but then also ones that want the special thing. What's the the mix so I feel like we could figure it out <laughs> like where it's gonna go we have like a a vision for say in the next year if you look at it very like pragmatic like it's gonna come down to the product like you know that's gonna drive the market and then it's gonna come down to I don't know I think outlets and retail and like where people are gonna be able to uh, generate money off of it in a way I think if we did like an analysis on the glory, you know, because I was talking about streetwear as like these peaks of like the explosions, which were the best parts to be a part of. And then we all like collectively, the current state of streetwear is built off the <laughs> every rent that wasn't paid for, <laughs> that mm -hmm. every collapsed business of every streetwear movement from Japan to New York is like, we're all living off of all those failed businesses. But if you went back and looked, who knows, maybe that was the reason, is that, like, say, Nam de Guerre, for example, like, place that brand now, it would be, like, the 35-year-old's answer to streetwear, mm -hmm. you know, it's, like, it's the brand that they can wear, it's well-made, it has, like, a flavor of streetwear, but isn't so, like, teenage, but, you know, the store's out of business, the brand, you know, but how closely do you think was that connected to the people, to the people running it? Because um, that—that's always also the yeah. the question. It, it was were they too early with it? Was the style not right for the time, or were the people not able to to manage? Because they were pretty successful. Yeah. They had the Nike collabs. 
Um, yeah, they had the image they were making things in Japan. They were doing it. I think it was a bit too. The only thing I could say, like without too much of an opinion, I feel like that this like slowly growing public of people mm -hmm. that are willing the fever and like had the money and the taste level wasn't at the high enough level mm -hmm. to like sustain the whole concept because to me they were like a leader in the idea of like it's like 4.0 streetwear yep. where it's like highly intelligent relation to the street but it's not like so obvious and i would say like first degree streetwear is like it's a step away from like Canal Street, like mm -hmm. ironic saying, put it on a t-shirt. It's not bad or good, you know, I've done it all. But that's, you know, how it just grows along. And I think if you look at our whole demographic, the current state of streetwear, it's already on like 2.5, you know. And so there's businesses that can sustain themselves without even being streetwear. But so for phase two, it's sort of like, you're not looking for the quick reaction. You're sort of like, this is only made for like a core group of people. Your friends. Friends, your street, you know, Lower East Side, it could be, and it's like, y you know it's gonna resonate here, and then it's like golden. And then what happens is people who are outside the circle start seeing people with the circle, mm. and are like, oh. And as the further you get up, the less the way it's like dependent on the brand logo or like identifier. I'd say phase three of streetwear is like, it's more like hinged upon who is doing it. You know, like if, like if you say so-and-so creative director who left Nike and so-and-so from Japan just started this thing. You know, as a further way you get, it's like not the brand. Mm -hmm. It's more like who, what, when, where, why. And then I would say, you know, as it gets further, who, like the end is where Nam de Guerre is an example. Like that was on a phase like phase four with before mm. the f the pure engine, you know, before union was union all the way. And then there was this huge demand, not specialists going to New York and just going to this one store, like the whole world looking to find this one thing. You say like, look at a brand like Bape. That was like, it, why BAPE is special, I think it was like three of those phases at one time, way ahead of the curve, and drove it. It was like, to me, BAPE is the equivalent of Fendi. You know, like they did an event together mm -hmm. early in the images seeing like Karl Lagerfeld, because he took, he was first and took his vision so far, so fast, as a way to say like, this is how far I see streetwear. You know, I see it like, meticulous store, I have iconic prints, I have my own monogram, I have bait, but then I also have, to me, which is like, it, that's why I loved it, it was like tier one, which is like the bait head t-shirt. Which you could never get. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's like always a whole thing. The same thing also with Supreme, they always have something that you always want, but you can never get, so you get the next best thing. Yeah. So keep the, the people always on their toes. And then sometimes you just throw it at them and then they're happy, but you don't do them for another yeah, five or six years. You're literally with the joystick. That's what we had when we carried Supreme in our shop in, in I think, six or seven years. They only did the box logo <laughs> t-shirt once. One time. One time only. And um, it's like, it's, that's the genius, or like Nego, the, uh, the last orgy, you know, like the theology of how it started is similar in terms of like, I don't know what the legend is, like make 20 tees, give out 10, sell the other 20. But it was about like, it was about establishing something right away and then having it evolve. And I think that's where, why BAPE to me is obviously the, the, the greatest example of streetwear, but it was both ahead of its time and right on time because it made the, the, made the market is that it, it was fulfilling like three of the five categories at one time. So it was, they knew the, the ape head, skate thing, graphics, and they were very, the variants over time and the pure like offering. Mm -hmm. It was not wholesale to my, like for the most part, but it was like full collections that were taking retail, like full, you know, like there was stuff that would sell it right away. And then there was like properly merchandised outerwear, shoes, accessories. It was like, 
plus the campaign, you know. I think they always made sure that there was something you could pick up at the shop. Yeah. So even if they didn't have the Bape Head T-shirt, there was the yeah. Bape Head keychain <laughs> or ashtray or, or glass. Or I think that's also something that a lot of like the younger brands might overlook. Uh -huh. It's something like you need people to always be able to buy something and you're not always going to buy the 600 euro jacket yeah. But if you really like the brand you want something and that's yeah. something you can pick up and with the bigger brands It's like you can get the perfume yeah, or the handbag the handbag yeah. never or the socks. The Celine ham yeah, it's so like never completely sold out. There's nothing you don't go to the, the corner and be like hey yep. There's nothing for me. It's properly merchandised currently what resonates like say with like antisocial or you know I think a number of things like the sentiment a lot of brands like you know you're just forced with these brands to like sum up what you're doing in like 10 words or something like that mm -hmm. because uh, before it's so easy to start before you even do that you know like I think in the older era you didn't even need to do that like you know like a supreme didn't need to write it down because it's like the office of whoever was thinking about it. They're like drinking the same beer. They're like, you know, well, whatever. I, it's appears, I mean, Supreme's probably the worst not example such a good example. example <laughs> <laughs> because it's always the the, whenever anyone brings it up, it's the best and worst thing you could do because he's a genius. <laughs> yeah, because he's got back. it all figured out. <laughs> yeah. Otherwise, he wouldn't be where he is. <laughs> yeah. But you're right. I think like a skate brand, they would just do the t shirts because they love yeah, the design. Yeah, skate brand is a skate. Yeah. Because what I was going to get to is like, current things that resonate now it's basically like there's been this moment in briefly in youth cultures like sad boys thing which you know young lean or it's a great sentiment it's like it's, I look at like a post Kanye sort of thing which is like you know you have like gangster rap and then you have like average kid who knew that average kid was going to actually beat gangster rap you know the Kanye like figured that out and then it's like whole next generation you don't have to be a gangster mm. it's not bloods or crips or like being tough so then you have that and then fast forward 2012 or something like that the next take on that sort of like regular kid is like the emo kid and then you put that out there then you wait shit it's like Kurt Cobain resonates more 10 years after because it's like hey, who is really that confident? And then you have all these like grunge kids and that's like the whole thing. So like sad boys, it's like a hipster version of like being emotional, which is awesome because it's a real trait that actually resonates more than being like confident. So it's like start a brand that the messaging is that. It's going to be ironic to wear, but it's fun because it's like, it's on the trend of like emotional trend. There's something super key, how I think about streetwear. It's about like, it's like a deer running and you're pulling the, you're pulling like a target. As long as you hit it, you're gonna kill it. So, and it's all like the landscape is always changing. There's like shit moving at all the right time. If you get that one, then you can, your chances of getting another one are probably increased or whatever. You know, it's not guaranteed. It could just be the one. But that's but people need to figure out that moment when they hit it, right? Yeah. So they need to see it and hit know it, it and know it that they hit it, right? Exactly. And that's the key, I think, for uh, what's missing new brands yeah. to find that point. Like, is is there a, a moment then when you say, okay, I have to do wholesale now? Like <laughs> the whole direct sale, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, really yeah, worked exactly. out for me well. But now I need a bit more consistency. And now I start wholesaling it. Therein like, lies the mastered <laughs> class. Yeah. Because it's like you can do streetwear yourself. But the things that we've learned along the way is like how to take a passion project and actually make it the, the most real project yeah. that it could possibly be in the genre that we've made up while living is streetwear collectively everyone sort of added to it i think the reason why there's name brands that we can reference are because they saw that moment where they hit it and then they built a plan around it using the tools that they had whether it's and it's infused with their own production it's having a sales team having not having one doing wholesale 
all the while juggling all those things and then coming up with another idea off the back of it. So you have your brand DNA and it's like you sort of open your front door and like what next? You know, like how to make that DNA apparent to people, apparent to stores, apparent to tastemakers. I think the key is the key is actually in your DNA of the brand. It's not, you know, it's not outward facing. It's like if your brand is about a rock and roll type grunge aesthetic, then you need to sort of like, you're dealing with something that's in your head and then you're trying to like make it resonate. So there's an establishment. There's mm -hmm. gonna be a collective thumbs up or thumbs down. That's how you're gonna win, no matter what. It can be bad or good, but some sort of establishment, whether it's buyer, or whether it's an ad, like a blog that's gonna post your thing, they have to see it look at some lookbook photos, see the name, in two seconds decide, hey, is this cool or not? I think speaking for us, then I'll let you like tackle it, is if when you look under the hood, there's something there. You know, if you look under the hood and there's things that are consistent, it's actually like a fresh point of view, and you're actually like impressed that there is something under the hood and that's like, oh, the name of the brand re resonates with who you are. Resonates, oh, you're from New York, you're from Topeka, Kansas, and you're charting your course in something new because, oh, I can see the influences of what you're bringing to the table. I think that for every brand who's like swinging the door open, like looking at the outward facing world trying to like make a resonance, you know, unless you have that, then, or unless your DNA is like apparent and you're like forward facing pitch, are you like getting anywhere? But what's your thoughts? Well, you have to know your identity, which we have covered now. Yeah. And then you need to see, is there an outlet for, for my identity? Is there the shop that fits oh, with yeah. what I'd like to do right away? If you have that shop, it could be in your hometown, which is the easiest for you. Yeah. You can just Network. go check it out. Maybe it's the shop that you could go and buy your own stuff. Yeah. Um, if it's not, then you need to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Maybe you're looking at a foreign magazine. That's where you get your influences from. Then maybe that market is the one that you need to be you know, yeah. aiming for, which is a bit more difficult because you need to find someone <laughs> in that market to help you sell your product to that market. Yeah. But maybe it's for that market. It's cool to have like that exotic brand from so far what you away. just said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that for them could be a special thing. But getting there is now is much easier. You could just write them an email yeah. or maybe you know fly there. Yeah, just, yeah. You know, Go uh, to the office. It's much cheaper. And for me, you know, when I look at what brands we've dealt with in the past, like Acronymous yeah. is the perfect example for a brand where they had their DNA, their identity figured out at a very early point. But there was no market for it. There wasn't a shop for it. There was not the publication to write about it. So they had, had to make it up for themselves. They had to do their own, they had to do their own wholesale. They had to find their own shop, which happened to be our shop. <laughs> we used to be three in the beginning. Aerosmith yeah. was a partner in the shop. Oh, gotcha. So that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. There were some shops. There was actually one shop in Berlin that used to carry acronym, but they uh -huh. weren't able to sell it. <laughs> and then There's when that. he started Stone Island Shadow, yeah. that same thing. I think there still are two shops in the whole of Germany that sell Shadow. Oh, really? So they created a whole category that wasn't really there anymore. And it took 10, 12 years for the market to catch up to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now, I think now it's the right time. Yeah. Now you see like kids dressing up head to toe in acronym, posing <laughs> in, in the US, in Korea, yeah, in, in Japan. Japan. And there are the right shops. And publication wise, it's difficult, but you have people like Hypebeast, they know about like technical apparel, sort yeah. of, they can write about that. You have a book, um, uh, there are some publications that can handle it. Maybe it's outdoor. They caught up to the technical part, like Pardon. not the outdoorsy type technical yeah, you yeah. Know, fabrics and, and jackets, but like the more the urban look. Yeah. And the urban it's side really of it's you need to have a very long breath, as you say in German. Uh -huh. You know. And what they did is they worked for other companies. Like they made their money designing for other brands while keeping up their own project. Exactly. And at the right point, they're like, here up. we are. 
Yeah. And then working with other brands like Nike, Nike Shoe. or also Help. Stone Island. Yeah, yeah. That really put them on the map. And a lot of people just took notice of that brand because of these side projects. Having patience, obviously, is like a key, you know, for a brand like Acronym or my brand or anyone else. It's like knowing when it's like critical moment, but also knowing when you can just like potentially partner up. And, and design with somebody else to sort of like get your name or credibility or experience while still working on your old thing, you know? The idea with your own brand is that it sort of grows. Once mm -hmm. it's not growing, that's like the bad thing. <laughs> it's staying still isn't a bad thing, you know? Like just continually doing it, trickling sales, still like wearing it or having it out there, reaching out to you know, if it needs influencers or if it doesn't, it just needs new imagery mm -hmm. to update your Instagram, you know, then like there's that angle. And I think that's also interesting for up and coming brands and creatives mm -hmm. because the bigger established brands, the majors, they're always looking for exactly that sort of input. Yeah, yeah. Because they are like the big machines and they work slow, but they yeah. know, you know, there are these There's cool kids <laughs> down there yeah. and they need, they need these cool kids for impulse. It's important, so yeah. So that could help you as a brand. When you see a brand, what sort of peaks you're in, like <laughs> amongst like the current muck of like, now there might be like eight times more brands and things popping up on your radar, whether mm -hmm. it's like, you're looking at street style photo and you notice this one graphic pop up a couple times. That's a really relevant question, I think. Yeah. It's like when you come across something that's brand new, because that's why I love hearing you talk about, like say an antisocial. I was going to say, that is the <laughs> best example. I think you've seen a was, bunch and then yeah. for you, and I know it from an American thing, but I, the fact that it's like popped up on your radar is telling. I. I think it started on Instagram and yeah. I have some friends in LA and they must be friends with Nick, the guy who does it. Yeah. And they started not even posting like the cap, but just posting selfies or pictures of themselves wearing the cap. And you could see like the, the thing, the, the hit on the side. And then a friend of mine who works for Nigo now, he had a t-shirt and he said, hey, thanks Nick, you know, <laughs> for the shirt. And that was probably one and a half years ago. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know why that, Maybe the, the fact that these people were wearing it, because I didn't know anything about the brand. You yeah, couldn't really yeah, yeah. do any research. There was no website. I didn't know the guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was just like, why are they, where is it coming from? Why are these people, exactly. like, all closely connected, all of a sudden wearing the caps and the T-shirts? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I thought, you know, this is something interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what it's about, and it doesn't really matter. It's something that's interesting exactly. somehow. And then I thought, should I put this up on my Instagram or yeah, on yeah. my website? But then I thought I couldn't really talk about it. There was nothing to say. Yeah, yeah. And then I just put it up and I and said, there's nothing to say about this, but it's somehow, it's yeah. cool. And then this other website picked it up and then wrote a whole paragraph. <laughs> about how you posted it. No, they didn't. Well, I yeah. don't know. No, they said, well, there's nothing to say about this, but we have to say something in order for our you know, CEO uh, oh, value yeah. to go up and the traffic. And then I thought, well, why do you write about this? There's nothing to write about. It's either, you know, it's yeah, really yeah. bizarre. And then it sort of turned into this thing. Yeah. And um, it's not really evolved from that. It's still the one yeah. design. And the, um, I'm not sure whether he, he counts on having like consistency or whether he really sees it as a brand or is yeah. it just like something that off the moment, make money off of it, milk it, and then if it's gone, it's gone. Yeah. Um, but if you have such a moment, then you need to have the right tools yeah. if you'd like to build a brand. Yeah. So which are the tools? You need to have elevator pitch is what I call yeah, it. Like yeah, yeah. what's your brand about? You need sort of like a lookbook. You need uh, like an order sheet. <laughs> no, it's just Something basic the, like that. The basic stuff, like do a PDF. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Send, send it out to people, communicate, yeah. be able to answer questions um, or find someone to help you with it. Yeah. And I think the best feedback is actually from your friends and that's how he started like giving out the stuff to friends yeah. and to people and you know they just wore it because they liked it. Otherwise they yeah. wouldn't have taken yeah, pictures exactly. of it. So I think that's really a good start. But then once you're over that phase, like your friends supporting you, okay, so what's the next step? Exactly. And, um, I think it's either that you have a plan and then you're like, hey, I know one of my friends is a sales agent. 
I'll just ask him yeah. to help me with the sales. Or you do it yourself. And from, uh, from Acronym, um, yeah. we've done their wholesale order system in 2005. <laughs> so they've done their own wholesale system. from day one. Yeah. And they only had someone in Japan help them with the sales. Uh -huh. And it was really a big task for them to go over to Japan to set up a showroom to make appointments with the buyers there. Because yeah. they wouldn't come you know, for one brand. They wouldn't <laughs> come to fly Europe. to, to yeah, Munich yeah. Of, of, of all places. <laughs> he had to go to Japan. Yeah. But it cost him a lot of you know, yeah. energy to be there. Yeah. But they've kept everything under their control. Which it's a key. lot of work. Yeah. And uh, they are pretty good in, in their operations. And like the whole back office thing yeah. is really precise and on point. Which is a good testament to brands feeling the, you know, those are both two very good examples because in your sort of like sweep of those things, like a number of things for me as like a young designer pop out, like from the acronym example, it's like when you create something that's hot, that's when you're, you're like you said, like your email starts blowing up with like, every type of option. A, from like somebody who wants it. B, to someone who's like, hey, where are you making your stuff? I can help you make it better. Mm -hmm. I can help you with sales. Like for acting, like the fact that they've held out and saved the business. I'm sure there was like three or four attacks. Oh like yeah. Like potential investors, potential sales team. Like, hey, look at our cup. You know, and like, and so that, those are threats that might not be instant payoff. It's like, hey, I can help you. Oh. It's almost like the worst thing that can happen to a brand that's like, uh, like we could do a whole episode on that. B so just remember that one. <laughs> like there needs to be a post streetwear <laughs> mastered class. Like once you do really well, <laughs> then watch out. Cause then like your investor, <laughs> the guy that's gonna take half your business is gonna email you saying he's gonna help you out. But going back to, and so I heard this like, you know, it's, it's like the power of four or something like once you hear four different people tell you about like a new movie or a street or mm -hmm. like uh, you know the sky is purple. Like if you heard that four times, like after the third time, the fourth time, it's like you adopt it mm -hmm. as like fact, and then that keeps like spreading. Which is like how emerging streetwear, I would say, is like the most fail-safe, whether it's good or not. It's like if it resonates and if I see it. If I see, some, that's how I find new things myself, is like scrolling Instagram, and if I see something resonate over here, whether I like it or not, resonate over here on people that I trust, mm -hmm. then it's like, hey, this is a new wave and you can't deny it. Yep. What I love, like screw, like peel off the sort of like, you know, I think through conversation, we've sort of like overanalyzed streetwear to the point where it's now, it's like too much. It's not that, it's not that crazy of a concept. It's sitting on a Photoshop file with a blank t-shirt and putting something really awesome on it to the point where people want it. You know, there's like a, there's that art, there's an absolute right. You know, the box logo, if it said like Pepsi, if it doesn't matter, it's just a perfect, and they own the placement, they own the proportion, they own the color, they own the concept of changing that color. Or the specific Vetma or Chrome Hearts, like, thing and you make it and it's desirable and so you just supply demand if it is a smaller supply than the demand then you have this need which is like allows you to sell more but where is it coming from the need the nowadays need. it used to be oh it's only available in japan, in japan. <laughs> i need it and i need it so bad yeah, that yeah, yeah. i i would do anything, anything to get it Proxy bid. But now, like, where's the need coming? Where's from? the need? Like uh, a yellow DHL T-shirt. <laughs> where's the need? Who created that need? Is it the website? Is it a celebrity? Yeah. Is it just the uh, like the absurdity of having that that you know people <laughs> want it because you can't like do a UPS, do a brown UPS T-shirt, <laughs> do a pocket shirt like a, a, po a brown pocket shirt with the UPS logo on it. Yeah. I'm sure if you put that in the shop, people will buy it, even though. I did. I have that a cease and desist in my email <laughs> <laughs> for it too, but that's besides the point. The y what I like, you know, that's where like if we do a topic on like creme de la creme, like 
there's some badass designers out there, you know, like, and I consider myself in the mix, you know, like, where it's like, I always distill it down to like sitting on a Photoshop file and being like, what are we throwing at this? Mm -hmm. Because there's, when you hit it, you hit it like, like the DHL concept. Ironically, we're both on this sort of, this is like a whole like hidden topic. It's ironic design, like the different mm -hmm. genres of streetwear design. It's still, it's always been there, but that DHL shirt or whatever one you can interchangeably place, it's gonna be, people are gonna need that because it correlates. But who's the person who needs that? Who's the customer? And I think that's something that we've been discussing, like who's the customer for your brand? Like if I tell someone uh, like an upcoming brand, um, here's the DHL shirt, charge 250 euros <laughs> for it and you'll sell shitloads <laughs> of it, they'll like, yeah. you know, they wouldn't take that seriously. <laughs> so <laughs> who needs it? Well, I mean, you can do a DHL shirt, and if yeah. it doesn't sell, it doesn't really matter. It's fine. Like, well, you've done it, you know. But but streetwear is new to fashion people. This is where the highways merged. And once streetwear, like... But you don't go, you don't, in your youth, you're not fashion. Like, you don't grow up to be fashion, or are you? There's, you know, like, what I think is important is, like, people grow up, they go through different phases, and they might end up at, uh, like, the higher end of fashion. Yeah. But haven't they gone through the streetwear phase as well? Yeah. So streetwear isn't really new to high fashion. It's just, it's high fashion people are the old street kids doing high fashion yeah. now and taking influence from street. What I... What Turning I, that into DHL t-shirts. Yeah, what I think is fashion people were just wearing fashion. Head to toe, Margiela meets Comme des Garçons. Like, to them, if you were going to mix in your fashion wardrobes, like you're going to wear Sakai, the lowest that you would go to like mix in your wardrobe would feel like you were completely in an outfit might be like some vintage Jill Sander trousers or something like that. You know, and then... All of a sudden, you see these style bloggers, Tommy Tan, kids showing up to fashion shows, kids that are working in your fashion office, the interns are coming in wearing old RAF coat, but then with Dickies, or they're wearing them with, you know, vintage DHL, vintage Coca-Cola mm -hmm. t-shirt. And they're looking, they're like, wait, high fashion. This new generation took that, mixed it with that, then bam, in one outfit, you have this juxtaposition. And then you take kids like me, who like obviously one foot like started designing based off like seeing one Chris Van Ash show and then studying Wrath and then being off that and then June Takashi, then Bape and then all this other stuff. So then, so my DNA is made up of, you know, everything from a nom dig, too many things. But then it's like, do a shitload of brands, they fail. Start some, end some. Do one Pyrex thing, end it. Because it was like too fevery. It was too, it's not a brand, it was a thing. Mm -hmm. Get all the way to where I'm at. And then I'm like, hmm, e dialing into the sentiment. And that's when I did like the UPS. It was, a, it was a blue collar collection. So I just took vintage, you know, my thought was like, take Streetwear's mentality, all you could do is go to your local screen printer and print on something else. So I was printing Pyrex on Polo. Mm -hmm. What I thought was an epiphany was to take, go to like Portobello Market, buy these vintage like Royal Mail and UPS and DHL work shirts and just cut them and place them as patches. Like take the blue collar and put it on a white collar thing. And that's just me discovering, of course, as well, like that ma, same spirit, like, you know, we're friends, didn't even discuss it, but, you know, they're smart enough to go to DHL and get the license. And I was just like, hey, who has time for that? <laughs> like, I'm just gonna make it, it's quicker to make it. And, yeah. and so, but what I'm underlining is like the creme de la creme, which I, I would put, you know, for sake of, for lack of like, you know, there's good things out there that resonate. I think it was a matter of taking the sentiment and then pushing it as far as you could go and the most like, and to me as far as you can go is fashion. There's a history of fashion, whether or not, like just how you use streetwear, mm. like fashion, 
like it or not, it's a genre of art, you know, like the highest level. And street where in the modern time is these two highways converging. Mm -hmm. And so if you can, you know, there's more people in this new highway because there's people that are like, I think the fever more comes from fashion people than streetwear people on that particular item. I think like the hoodie itself is a streetwear garment. So the hoodie offered by them is like a fever. There's a need for it because it's photographable. You can't get it. It's expensive. Yada, yada, yada. You know. So it's more, it's easier for brands now to start because they don't really have to focus on whether they're high fashion or street. They can just do whatever because everything is acceptable. Yeah, but I think it's like, it's a, it, that window will close. Like when we started out the conversation, like where do we think it will go? I think the bubble will have to burst. 